There's a place you probably haven't heard of before that's known for three things, extreme poverty, violence, and football players. It's called the Muck, and it lies on the eastern shore of Lake Okeechobee, a long forgotten about former agriculture hub in the middle of nowhere, Florida. There's nothing out here except for some housing communities, projects, and farmland. There's about 8,000 homes here. And only 40 miles away, within the same county, is this. Palm Beach is practically the wealthiest place you can live in America. It's filled with millionaires and more billionaires per capita than any other place in the country. It has about 8,000 people. These two places don't really know much about one another but comparing their completely opposite fortunes will put into perspective just how divided our population has grown. Palm Beach, Florida, home to country clubs and yachts. There isn't a home here worth under a million bucks these days. It's an island off of the Atlantic coast, just a short bridge away from West Palm Beach. The amount of wealth here is staggering. It's the kind of place where people shop at boutique outlets with their little dogs that have $35,000 diamond collars on. Just one of the billionaires in Palm Beach could buy up every single home over here on the shores of Lake Okeechobee, home to about 8,000 households. There's a handful of communities on the banks of this muddy lake, but we're going to spend our time in two of them, Belle Glade and Pahokee. If you live in Florida, you've probably heard of these places before, but you probably don't know what they look like, and I think you're going to be kind of shocked. We're going to begin in Belle Glade. There's about 20,000 people out here in no man's land, Florida. Four in ten of them live on government assistance, where the average household brings in about $2,000 a month. One in every four households brings in about $800 a month. There's some okay neighborhoods out here where houses are worth about $100,000. But a lot of what you'll see driving around here is not decent. A lot of this was once cheap housing thrown up for temporary workers, and then they became permanent hovels. Just blocks from City Hall are places that resemble the god-awful slums of third world capitals. Understandably, Belle Glade was once called the second most dangerous place in the country. At one point, half of the young men here had felonies. Belle Glade has a history of disease and overcrowding, of poor sanitation and malnutrition. It once had the highest rate of HIV infection in the country, so Floridians call it Bell AIDS. I saw some of the worst conditions I've ever seen here, and I've been to a lot of bad places. It's a lot of rundown apartments trash, and a lot of people standing around. It's sad and deserted. They call this place the Muck. It earned its nickname because a long time ago, this was all underwater. But then they drained the Everglades to make more farmland, and what was left behind was a mucky, muddy swath of land as far as the eye could see. Belglade was absolutely decimated by the Category 5 Lake Okeechobee hurricane of 1928. It was already mired in poverty, since the overwhelming majority of jobs were agriculture, and the destruction of the levees by the storm destroyed the town, and with it, the local livelihood. Belle Glade never really recovered from that storm. It's really unfortunate. A lot of people are great people out here. Another big part of the problem has to do with the decline in farming. At one point, this was the winter vegetable capital of the world. But mechanization made farming cheaper and humans weren't needed as much to toil the land. CBS News once did a documentary on Belle Glade called Harvest of Shame, which discussed the plight of all these migrant farm workers out here. For decades, black laborers were imported here to slog around in the fields. Belle Glade became known as a black ghetto or colored town. One in ten residents here is or was a Haitian farm worker too. Affordable housing is a big deal here. That is, if they can even find a place to rent. A lot of the older housing stock is crumbling in the mucky heat. But you can't tear these places down. I mean, where are you going to put these people if you start demolishing the fallen down buildings? One potential solution is 3D concrete housing like this. There's a company in the area that's working on that. These homes are really easy to construct in little time. 
Now driving around, you'll see job placement offices all over the area, but do these people even want to work? I know there's less farming jobs, but there's plenty around. And as we see when we visited Immokalee, it seems only the Hispanic population wants to toil in these fields. Some feel many of America's problems in areas like this stem from effort inequality, not income inequality. But there is hope, sorta. For a lot of the youth here, their goal is to win the sports lottery. There's been a lot of damn good football players from the Pahokee and Belglade area. At last count, there have been more than 60 NFL players that have come from this small part of the state. The players train by catching rabbits, and the speed some of these guys have is unbelievable. They also train year-round in the heat, making for more intense training than what people from cooler climates can train in. But not everybody can win the sports lottery, so they're trying to turn their fortunes around here. Not too long ago, the mayor of Belle Glade took a bunch of his colleagues up to the capital in Tallahassee to meet with state lawmakers. They asked for money for new roads, for new irrigation infrastructure, and for workforce training. They asked for $5 million bucks for a big rec center. The community also raised $30 million bucks to build 60 homes in the area, but that's just a tiny dent in this mess. Now this is nothing like what's happening over on the other side of the county in Palm Beach. Palm Beach is separated from Belle Glade by 44 miles of sugarcane, beets, and turnips. Over here, there's no worrying about where the next meal is going to come from. Their biggest worry today is whether or not they're going to get their favorite table at the country club. Of course, these folks pay a lot of taxes. Well, some of them do. But do these people even know what their taxes are going to? Have they even seen this? Probably not. Palm Beach County's commissioner said that when she goes to Washington and pleads for help for these folks, nobody believes there's poverty like this out here. Nobody from the East Coast ever comes out this way, so it's out of sight, out of mind. Now we're going to go to Pahokee. It's about 10 miles north from Belle Glade. It too is very poor and dangerous, but Pahokee seems a little bit less desperate. However, all over is subsidized housing built in the 1970s, a bunch of fallen down trailers and boarded up housing. Pahokee is about a third the size of Belle Glade. One in three Pahokee residents lives far below the poverty line. Poverty and crime are so bad here that residents want to dissolve the city entirely and turn this place into an unincorporated city to be managed by Palm Beach County. One thing you'll see when you drive around here are all the churches everywhere. And a lot of Pahokee folks were at church on this Sunday. Over here on Barack Obama Road is Pahokee's downtown. There's not much going on here. There's not much of anything going on here. It's also really polluted here, since they regularly burn the sugarcane off every season. There's been studies that say the water out here is contaminated with algae blooms and corporation fertilizer. As always, politics are in play here. Apparently, folks over in Palm Beach are pushing for the Lake Okeechobee water to be sent away from the fields and into their faucets. Some feel the water diversion concept would lead to potential environmental destruction, making things even worse for the folks way out here. And if you're curious, the folks that live way out here in this mess vote Democrat by a 5 to 1 margin. As we've learned over and over again on this trip, Florida certainly isn't Mickey Mouse and palm trees. It's much more complex than that. Now, I try to reach out to many so-called activists in these communities. None responded. Supposedly, organizations like Guardians of the Glades and Glades Lives Matter were working to improve the situation here, but there's no word on if they're actually making a difference. I also had the mayor of Bell Glade schedule for a call, but he backed out at the last minute. So instead, we're going to talk to Dr. Daniel LaRoche. He's the author of a book called How to Be a Successful Black Man. We're going to talk with him about what's going on out here right now. Dr. LaRoche, um, you know, you wrote a book that I think can can kind of really address, you know, what I'm talking about in the video. Um, you know, you kind of know what's happening in this part of Florida. I, um, in what ways do you think that the black population in places like Belle Glade and Pahokee struggle like this when it comes to graduation rates and incarceration and crime and poverty and all that? Well, you know, when you want to answer the uh, the questions with the mystery of these issues, you got to really go back and look at the history. 
And so when I look at, you look at poverty, well, why, how did this happen? What, what happened? You know, what, why is it like this? And you look back at the past, in the past you had black communities that were very prominent, like Black Wall Street, okay? They had on grocery stores, on hospitals, on businesses, very, very successful, uh, doing great. And what happened? It got completely burned down by a mob, okay? And there were never any reparations made for that to address that. Uh, also, we have to look at the resources. Some of these poor areas, they're not getting the resources. The school districts aren't getting the funding. The hospitals aren't getting money. Uh, Education is not getting money. Uh, you know, infrastructure, loans, redlining. There's a lot of societal, unfortunate uh, structural problems. So those communities are not getting resources compared to other communities across town that are getting resources. And this takes place not only in those communities, but all across America, you see that. And that's from the history that we have that we still have to reconcile. Why are they not getting the resources? Why do you think that is? Um, well, you have to look at, at the government level, you know, who's making the decisions, uh, who's the government represented by, or people from the community on the government boards or not. Uh, and so uh, the decisions that are being made, uh, you can look at that. and You can just look at the books and see uh, what's going on. So you have to make good investments and, uh, and, and help repair some of that damage that's been done from our history. Your quote from, from James Baldwin that you mentioned, um, if you're black in America, how can you not be angry all the time? Um, is it okay for the black population to be angry and frustrated at times then? No, I don't think it's, it, it, you know, you have to try to deal with the situation that you're in. I mean, you know, you're seeing every day on the news uh, images of, you know, black individuals being killed, whether it's by law enforcement or by other black individuals, uh, that's not something to be happy about. Uh, what can we do to solve those problems? And you see many of these things taking place every day. Uh, sometimes when you're working in a neighborhood and you're seeing poverty on the street, uh, that's, whether it's black or white, that's not something you want to be happy about. Why do we have so much poverty in America? And there's more poor white people than there are poor black people in America. So this goes on both sides. We shouldn't be happy about that. We should all be angry about that and try to solve those problems. Mm -hmm. what, what, what can the, the, the black population, what, do, what can they particularly do that's unique to, to their situation to, to change, to, to get out of the, of the generational rut that some of them are in right now? Well, what caused the generational rut? Um, you know, I mean, the American, if you look at the American history, we just celebrated July 4th weekend, 1776, and people were very happy about independence. But at that time, blacks were on plantations as slaves on that particular day. And so that's an interesting dichotomy that you have historically. And it's only recently within my generation through the civil rights movement that we've had been able to integrate. When I went to Cornell Medical School, I was one of the first groups of minorities to actually go into that medical school to be able to become a physician after hundreds of years in America in terms of people being here. So we have a lot of work to do to try to uh, repair the damage that's been done and try to address these problems of poverty, which is not just black and white, and uh, equality and uh, equal opportunity. Mm -hmm. Knowing what you know, and you, you're, you're probably, you know, I, certainly you're not an expert in, in, in this situation that I'm talking about with, with Florida. Um, but, but, you know, there, there's a lot of um, very poor, um, there's a very poor black population in Florida that just um, can't seem to get the resources, like you said, that can't seem to turn it around. Um, what would be the advice that you would give this particular population to gain personal growth, self-confidence, to try to get out of that situation? Well, it's, it's not advice I would just only give to this particular population because there are white communities in America, too, that are very poor, like Boonesville, Kentucky. is probably a similar situation. Uh, but one of the things you could do at a national level, increase minimum wage to $15 an hour so everyone has a livable wage. That will uplift everybody in that respect. Okay? Provide universal health insurance. Medical debt is a big cause of poverty. Okay, if everyone has health insurance, everyone has a Medicare card, you don't have to worry about your health, you can get health care, and then you don't have to worry about going debt because you're not getting the health care that you need. Those are two uh, particular remedies that would go very well. Uh, distributing educational resources to schools 
uh, more equally. And also providing uh, a training, job training, uh, trade training at the high school level. That used to be done in the past when you had people on assembly lines at GM and different things like that. Now it's more automated more, uh, with computers. So providing earlier computer technology training at a younger level, at the high school level. So people have usable skills in high school. They can come up with skills they can use to get a job, whether it's plumbing, electrical, uh, science, medicine, computer technology at that level. So if we can get everyone in America back to working again, that will reduce poverty. I get you. There's an argument that could be made that that, that the black population has had a, a rough go at it in the past. Things were not equal then. Um, are, are you saying that things are still not equal and that the black population does not have the same opportunities that the, that the rest of the country does? Well, the net worth of a white family is about one hundred seventy one thousand dollars a year. And uh, and the black family is about seventeen thousand dollars a year. So there's a tenfold gap in terms of the, the wealth that's there. And so um, a lot of work needs to be done to address that. And like I said, with resources, with structural changes and improvements, uh, we have to continue to work at that to address those problems because that hurts the productivity of America overall. And also to have so much poverty, that hurts American productivity as well. No, I get you. I get you. But I, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is like, um, do, do you feel that the, the same opportunities um, are not there for, for the black population in terms of, you know, having the um, access to education, um, being able to, to work for what you want to attain in life? Um, well, I mean, it's getting better. Uh, I think, for example, in different neighborhoods, the educational resources are a little bit different, unfortunately. Although that we have laws against uh, segregation, unfortunately, across America, you still see a lot of residential segregation. Like on one side of the town, the black population lives. On the other side of the town, the white population lives. And when you look at the schools in those settings, usually they're not getting equal amount of same resources in that respect, and that creates a problem. I've seen that a lot, and I still see that today. And we're working to try to dismantle some of those things. Uh, standardized testing has been used as a gatekeeper that's kept some blacks out of schools uh, because standardized testing is really just associated with wealth, okay? Those people that have higher wealth can afford better test prep, and they do better in those tests. So those people that are poor uh, don't do as well on the test prep, but there's no correlation with um, how well you do on a standardized test and how good of a surgeon you're going to be, how good of a doctor you're going to be in any respects. It's just only correlated with wealth. And recently at the medical level, at the medical school level, we've changed some of those tests to pass fail. So it's not a use as a way to keep people out and you can still have talented to people pursue any particular specialty that they want. So. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of progress that needs to be made. Uh, even in my specialty of ophthalmology and as an African-American physician, the 40 million blacks in the United States, the only 400 black ophthalmologists in the United States. So in many black communities, they don't have access to eye care. We have 10 times higher rates of blindness from glaucoma, uh, increased rates of blindness from cataracts, diabetic retinopathy. So we need to train a lot more black doctors as well to meet the needs of those communities as well. And this is just one example, but this applies to like the law profession, almost any profession you speak of, you have similar numbers. If you could pick one thing to try to turn this around and get the black population on the right track once and for all, people talk about, you know, the family structure, they talk about the, the, the youth don't have guidance, um, incarceration. Um, what, what would be the one thing that you think if you were in charge, you would do to, to just turn this around and get it going in the right direction? Well, I think the labels of white and black are artificial constructs. That was started in the 1600s so that whites can accumulate wealth, obtain a land, obtain a power. This is an artificial construct because, you know, here's a piece of white paper and I've never seen a white person this, this white. So it's an artificial construct. We're all different shades of pink, brown, this and that. I mean, I'm pretty light skinned black, but because I have an Afro, I guess I fall in the black. So we have to get rid of that uh, white black labels in that respects for all people. And the second thing is uh, Ma'at. Ma'at, this was the original cross, the cross 2000 years before uh, uh, Jesus Christ. And this part of the cross represents the divine feminine, the womb of the woman, the male, 
the two children, life, family, harmony, balance, truth, reciprocity. There are 42 laws of Ma'at. When you hear the Ten Commandments, these were 42 commandments that existed 2,000 years before. And then that provides the moral code, the moral foundation for you to live your life at peace amongst ourselves, our family, and as a society. And that's the one thing I would make sure that we all learn in schools, okay, and we all learn amongst each other to help live cohesively as a people, as they used to do in ancient Kemet as well, which is one of the greatest civilizations that ever existed. They built the pyramids. They had the first author of the first book, Patahotep. They had the first doctor, Emhotep. Uh, so it was a tremendous civilization that lived in peace, uh, prosperity, and was really the foundation of the current civilization we have now. How is racism getting worse? Is it getting better in this country, in your opinion? I think it's gotten better, but we still have uh, pockets of people with racism. And unfortunately, what uh, some people have termed like white fear uh, in that respects and people, you know, uh, you know, want to maintain and hold on to this, quote, whiteness, which is an artificial construct and, and this fear. I think those are real issues that have to be addressed because I've heard that term a lot in the media and uh, people pushing that forward uh, and uh, seem like they don't want to see people of color do well. They feel that there's a fear because, you know, whites may become a minority in America in that respect. But you know, globally, people of color were always the majority globally for thousands of years. I mean, until I mean, until there was like colonization of America and Canada and Brazil and Australia. I mean, all those lands were populated by brown and black people all before, and they lived peacefully and had uh, uh, good civilizations in that respect. So we have to heal that. We have to heal that, repair that, and uh, you know get along and address some of the more serious problems like climate change and some of the damage we're doing to our planet with pollution uh, in that respect, because uh, we're so busy going to Mars right now. They have new drones in Mars going on right now, but we're destroying our planet. I mean, some of the areas, I mean, in the ocean is just pure garbage in some areas in the ocean. Uh, fish are dying. Uh, you know, a lot, we, we have to be worried about how we're going to take care of ourselves on our planet to make sure we all survive. I get you. Um, and going back to your point, I mean, myself and, and the, the people that I associate with and friends and family, we would love nothing better than to see the, the, the African-American population succeed. I, I don't think that there's a, a white person that I know that would that inherently wants the black population to fail. Um, I, I There are, I'm sure, parts of the white population that think like that. But I I, I have not heard that mentioned at all um we we all want the country to be better um i i, I does it do you feel that the black population feels that that the white population is really truly thinks that that they want the well you know i mean there has to be like accountability i mean i'll give you an example i just saw a video of an unarmed young man that was you know running away and got shot like 90 times by police officers you know if that was a caucasian man there would no be ninety. There would not be ninety shots. I know that for a fact. Okay, when they when, when police officers approach a Caucasian person, they'll try to talk to them. They'll be very restrained. This and that. You know, I've seen the differences there. So there are still some problems that exist. Uh, I'm not saying that they woke up one morning intending to shoot somebody ninety times, but there's something inside them that's you know <laughs> that's an issue <laughs> to do that to a young black male. Uh, and and that has to be addressed uh, in that respect. And then also, um, you know, we live in a very violent society. I mean, we're seeing a lot of mass murders taking place as well right now also. And so we have to, you know, look back and see what we're doing wrong and what we can do better to uh, have a stronger uh, moral foundation and greater connectivity and uh, less violent energy. I have no, no idea. Not all police. Most police officers are very good. Huh? Right. I work, but, 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 N, I work with the NYPD. I'm an NYPD police surgeon, as a matter of fact. So most police officers are very good, but we have to have accountability with some of this, uh, some of this, you know, uh, aberrant behavior amongst a handful of people that are not being dealt with in an accountable way. Mm hmm. 
let's talk about your book, How to Be a Successful Black Man. Yes. Um, tell us, uh, tell us the lessons learned from the book, and uh, and um, you know what what would the uh, the reason for writing it, and and what we can all learn from the book, and so we can get some people to get out there and and read it. Well, I talk about uh, the ancient comedic teachings of uh, the moral compass of the forty two laws of Maat, uh, which help give a good moral compass uh, to be successful in society. Um, I talk about some of the issues. Uh, so that they're not taught that. We're not taught that here in American schools. And so that's an important part of world history that people should know, both black and white. And then I talk about what we've been through, through the slave trade, and um, how we came out of that, and pearls of success, of what we need to do to be successful with education, uh, avoiding incarceration, uh, working with each other, and uh, you know, pearls to do well, pitfalls to avoid. And it ends with a, uh, a nice poem by one of my mentors, Dr. Gerald Deese, uh, to have young men working together with each other. So it's a nice book. It's a good read by all families. Uh, it has some good references, uh, good stimulates, some good conversation. And I think uh, I was speaking to young black men because of the negative media images that we see all the time. But it's a book that everyone can learn from. Give me, give me one, one lesson that a young black man could take away from your book based on some of the things you talked about, about education, incarceration, working together, all that stuff. Um, really, the 42 laws of my eye. It's a little bit too long for me to get into it here, uh, but it's you know, an expansion of the Ten Commandments with this 42 uh, that give you a good moral code of conduct represented by uh, this cross, Ma'at. It's very important. I think that's the most important uh, thing that the book teaches. And it's a just an introduction to that ancient history that's the foundation of our civilization uh, and it's you see this spirituality in many different religions today and educational institutions and uh, it just goes back to the origin of that it's been a pleasure talking to you i i, I really think um you you hopefully you know people can um learn a lot and pick up the book and read about all the stuff you're talking about and uh it sounds like it's got a really unique angle to it and um you did a very good job of explaining it well, thanks for um, uh, spending some time on this important topic and, uh, and giving the opportunity for discussion, discussing of different ideas. And you know, hopefully we can continue to make some progress. Yes, sir. Dr. LaRoche. Are you looking to move and need advice? I do consulting. That's right. I'll sit down and talk about where the next perfect place for you and your family should be. I do it all the time. Together, let's find you a new home that's safe and checks all your boxes. You can get my email in the description to find out how I can help you find your perfect relocation. And I can also help you find your new house too. Email me and I'll work with you on not just helping you figure out where to move, but I can help you find your perfect home too. That's right. I know awesome, reliable agents all over the country, and I'd love to connect you to somebody who can help you search for that perfect home. Hey everyone. So it's pretty clear by now that elected leaders aren't gonna help you. If you don't like what you saw in this video, demanding change won't work. You're gonna have to do it on your own. If you wanna be safe and want your community to be a place where people wanna live, you're gonna have to clean the place up yourselves. You're gonna have to work with your friends and neighbors to lower crime. Politicians clearly don't care as much anymore. It's up to us. This is Sage Nick's manager. This has been a Corner House Entertainment production.